Firstly, I would, I would like to thank today's speaker for joining us for this session of the Joseph C. Miller Memorial Lecture Series and for your willingness to deliver this presentation in person here in Bonn as part of the hybrid on-site and online event organised by the Bonn Centre of Dependency and Slavery Studies. Uh, today's speaker, Dr. Juros Matic, is a research fellow of the Austrian Archaeological Institute, uh, the Austrian Academy of Sciences, Vienna and Austria. He received his PhD from the Institute for Egyptology and Coptic Studies of the University of Munster, Germany in 2017. For this work, he received the Philippa, uh, Philippica Prize of Harrods in 2018 and the Best Publication Award, Award of the Austrian Academy of Sciences in 2020. Since 2012, he has been a team member of several archaeological missions in Egypt, including Tel Adaba, Aswan and Komomo. He was co-chair of the Archaeology and Gender in, in Europe, uh, the uh, abbreviated AGE, community of the European Association of Archaeologists from 2016 to 2019. He is currently finishing a project on Old Kingdom pottery from Kumombo and studying Asian Egyptian myths of spoils of war. His most recent publications are Violence and Gender in Asian Egypt. 2021, and Beautiful Bodies, Gender and Corporal Aesthetics in the Past in 2022. His presentation today deals with gender as a frame of war in Asian Nubia. Um, so again, we, we thank you warmly for, for joining us today. Uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Adam, for this wonderful introduction. I would first like to thank the audience here in the room and also everyone who is following us online. And first, of course, to express my enormous gratitude to the Bonn Center for Dependency and Slavery Studies for inviting me to deliver my lecture this afternoon in Joseph C. Miller Memorial Lecture Series. As a historian, Miller wrote extensively on Africa, women and child slavery. I hope that my lecture titled Gender as a Frame of War in Ancient Nubia will do justice to his work in its connection both to Africa and the enslavement of women and children. I'm going to start this lecture perhaps a bit unconventionally, but rest assured that this introduction is related to the main topic, although it might not seem so at the first glance. So I visited Khartoum in February 2019 for the first time. Just the day after I left the country, finishing my work in the Sudan National Museum, Anti-government protests, which started in December 2018, continued. A state of emergency was declared in February 2019 as a result of the protests. Eventually, the protests led to the military removing of Umar al-Bashir from power, installing the traditional a transitional council in his place, led by Ahmed Awad ibn Auf. Soon after I left the country, on the 8th of April, 2019, the photo you can see on the left uh, of this slide appeared in the media. This is a photo of a 22-year-old student, Allah Salah, standing on top of a car, dressed in white, wearing gold earrings, and leading a crowd of demonstrators in a chant. Videos were also shared on Twitter, and the woman in question was very quickly labeled as the Kandake, of the Sudanese revolution. The choice of the nickname is not accidental. It refers to a feminine royal title, probably designating the mother of the ruling king in the Meroite kingdom of ancient Sudan, although the exact meaning is still debated. The golden earrings of Allah Salah might have reminded some archaeologically informed people of the jewelry found in the tomb of Meroite Queen Anna Mishacheto, buried in Pyramid 6 at Pegaravia North in the cemetery of Mera. Since this image appeared and the nickname settled, a number of Egyptologists and Sudan archaeologists started including it in the slides of their presentations, including myself, mostly dealing with ancient Sudanese women. The simplest argument was either that there is some kind of a continuation of female power 
in ancient and modern Sudanese societies, which is a complete nonsense if you ask me, or that Allah Salah was inspired the, by the past narrated women carrying Kandaki title, but we do not have information that she was. This leads me to a problem I continue having with the last two arguments. Firstly, powerful women, just as men, then and now, are not only in power due to their sex or gender, but also due to their rank or class. I doubt that Allah Salah was alone during the protest, and I doubt that just any young woman could climb the car and leave the chat. Secondly, I have a big issue of romanticization of both the past and the present. Whereas Allah Salah was chanting on the car, other women were raped on the streets of Khartoum during the protests. Yet I did not hear any Egyptologists or Sudan archaeologists referring to this in their presentations. It seems that most of my colleagues in Sudanese archaeology understand gender archaeology as a romantic search for powerful women in the Sudanese past, priestesses or queens, for example. Although one of the new titles on this slide says that Sudanese women's bodies are not battlefields for political conflicts, history reminds us time and time again that unfortunately, very often, they are. Ultimately, whether or not we view the civil war in Sudan to the image of Allah Salah or the victims of sexual violence on the streets of Khartoum, what we are dealing with here are different frames of war, a term found in the title of my lecture. It originates from the later work of American philosopher, feminist and queer theorist Judith Butler, and it describes the way media frames or constructs our experience of war. Butler demonstrates this using examples from recent history of the USA, and some of her examples are focused on gender. Namely, in gender as a frame of war, enemies are often feminized, and otherwise non-normative homosexual act of their penetration, real or metaphorical, is legitimized to war. Some examples I find quite illustrative are the so-called fag bomb, a missile on board USSS Enterprise with the message hijack this fags, photographed on the 11th October 2000, uh, 2001. Another one I found was in the video game Halo 2, and it says, hold on to your butt. The fact that enemies need to be feminized or homosexualized in order to be dominated, in reality and in metaphor, is actually reflecting a heteropatriarchal gender system in which women are, as a whole, subordinated to men. Of course, that does not mean that Hillary Clinton is subordinated to a G.I. Joe, just as it does not mean that the Kandake, Queen of Meroe, is subordinated to a Meroitic soldier. The point here being that gender is relational and identity is intersectional, as argued by Kimberly Crenshaw in her seminal paper from 1989. Building on my earlier works on gender as a frame of war in ancient Egypt, in this lecture, I will turn to the evidence for gender as a frame of war in ancient Nubia. The written and visual sources in focus were produced by the ruling class of Napatan and Meroitic kingdoms in ancient Sudan. These kingdoms, known in ancient Egyptian sources as kingdoms of the land of Kush, developed in the first millennium BCE and the first centuries uh, CE. The kingdom of Napata developed in the aftermath of New Kingdom Egyptian occupation of Nubia, and even managed to conquer Egypt, establishing the double kingdom ruled by the 25th dynasty in Egypt. These rulers gradually lost their power in Egypt, and the territory of their kingdom shrank. Nevertheless, its successor kingdom with the capital in the royal city of Meroe was a rival both to the Ptolemies and Romans in Egypt. It was eventually defeated either by an economic decline or either by the kingdom, kingdom of Aksum in 4th century CE. In the continuation of this talk, I will focus on the gender structure of the Nubian list of spoils of war, representations of women and children as prisoners of war, 
feminization of enemies in ancient Nubian texts, and evidence of the participation of royal women in war. I will finish by arguing that all of these data urges us to stop romanticizing war and the Nubian gender system. My first observation of gender as a frame of war concerns the structure of the ancient Nubian list of spoils of war. Since spring 2022, I have been working on a side project on ancient Egyptian lists of spoils of war, and I inevitably included the Nubian list of spoils of war in my analysis. These Nubian lists of spoils of war are not numerous, but are nevertheless informative on the topic of gender, especially in comparison to Egyptian sources. The earliest Nubian lists of spoils of war are to the best of my knowledge dated to the reign of Tahaka and the latest to the reign of Akinidad. The former was the pharaoh of the 25th dynasty in Egypt and Kore of the kingdom of Kush. The latter was a Meroitic ruler of the last decades of 1st century BC and 1st century CE, well, the first decades of the 1st century CE, of whom we do not know much, unfortunately. In all of these lists, when prisoners of war are listed, men come before women who come before children. On several stele from the temple of Kava, we find text informing us on the military campaigns of King Tahaka. The Kava free stele of Tahaka, now in a knee cast fabric to take in Copenhagen, informs us on the provision of the temple of Amun at Kava in the form of male and female servants, Baku and Bakut, and the children of the rulers, Velo Hekal, or the Chechen Libyans. The Kava Sikh stila, now in Sudan National Museum of Khartoum, informs us that the king filled the temple of Amun in Kava with, among others, female servants, wives of the rulers of Lower Egypt, and the children of the rulers of every foreign land. In his long description from Sanam, Tahaka claims that the total of 544 men and women enumerated according to ethnonyms or toponyms, were presented as spoils of war to the temple. Kushite king Anamani, who ruled from 620 to 600 BC approximately, states in his enthronement stila from Kava, or Kava uh, 8 stila, now also in the Akasberg Lipotech in Copenhagen, that his soldiers gained control of all the women, children, and small cattle and property in the land of Ulahau in Nubia. The king appointed the captives as male and female servants of the gods. The annals of Hesiute, now in Egyptian museum in Cairo, also state that this narratic king gave booty to a moon of Napata, 50 men and 50 women. He also states that among others, he took male and female servants in the land of Metete, the annals of Meritic King Nastasen, now in the Egyptian Museum in Berlin, claimed that he gave a total of 110 men and women to Amun of Napata. Nastasen also claims in the same text that he captured a Yonku, the ruler connected to the rebels against him, and that he took all the women, all the cattle, and much gold. 2,236 women are listed. He also sees the rulers of Luboden, Mahae, Maxekata and Sarasarat, and all the women in their possessions. After this overview, one can observe the following pattern. In the Nubian list of spoils of war, humans come before animals, and animals before things. Among humans, men come before women, and women come before children. Very often, it is indicated that the women and children in question are related to the defeated ruler. The Nubian kings insist that they took his women. These prisoners of war are then allocated to different temples of Amun, such as those in Kava, Napata, or Sana. I observed a similar pattern in ancient Egyptian lists of spoils of war. Namely, in general, men come before women who come before children. When crossed with status, the order changes only slightly. Enemy rulers are followed by members of the elite soldiers 
such as Mariano. But wives of enemy rulers or diesel soldiers come before other men in list to spoil the war. The same case is with children of the rulers who are valued more than other prisoners of war, something we are also explicitly informed by the text accompanying a register depicting counting of the prisoners of war during the reign of Tutmosis III in the Pibutum 100 uh, of this year Rechnere. The accompanying text clearly describes the children of the foreign rulers as the best of the spoils of war. The Nubian lists of spoils of war seem to be patterned based on similar categories, with a notable exception of any elite soldiers among their enemies. The fact that the lists are structured based on the value assigned to the spoils of war indicates that when across the agenda, we are informed that male prisoners of war were more valued than female prisoners of war, and that wives and children of foreign rulers were especially valued, just like in Egypt. Various depictions of imprisoned men, women, and children in ancient Egypt are numerous. In ancient Nubia, this is not the case. If we exclude the highly canonical motive of the bound prisoner, we are not left with much to discuss. Nevertheless, in one case, not only do we have women and children depicted as prisoners of war, but these depictions and their overall context open a myriad of questions. Temple M250 is located about one kilometer to the east-southeast of the center of the city of Mere, capital of the Meritic Kingdom. John Gaston first investigated this temple in 1910 to 1911, together with Archibald Seiss. The temple M250 was investigated further by Friedrich Hinker from 1984 to 1985. He dated it to the late first century BCE and early first century CE because of the royal cartouches of Akhidat found on fallen blocks. And I mentioned Akhidat earlier. According to Laszlo Torok, the temple was dedicated, in its later form at least, to the cult of Re, more precisely, to the unification of Amun with Re. Hinkel interpreted it more carefully just as the temple of Amun. M250 is the only Meritic temple with a depiction of the taking of the prisoners of war preserved at least to a certain extent whereas the registers of the northern wall of the temple could have been reconstructed, as you can see here on the left. The ones on the southern wall could not, as you can see here on the right. This is due to the fact that most of the blocks of the northern wall were in situ. Due to the lack of space on this slide, I had to cut the register of the northern wall into sections and place them here above each other. One should observe them from top to bottom. In reality, this is one continuous register. The scene starts with a procession of soldiers, continues with a battle, and then we have the depiction of prisoners of war and among them women and children, marked with a red rectangular on this slide. The register continues with spoils of war in the form of cattle, and then we see women and children as prisoners of war again. The register ends with the representation of a column temple. The reliefs are not in the best of state, and not much can be said about these figures since only lower body parts are preserved. When the southern wall is concerned, although the registers of the reliefs could not be reconstructed, some of the blocks are better preserved than those of the northern wall. Here, the entire figures of imprisoned women and children can be seen and recognized as Nubians. This is based on iconographic parallels from much older tribute scenes namely those from New Kingdom, Egyptian, private tombs, and temples. Nubian women are in these New Kingdom, Egyptian tribute scenes depicted, depicted with short hair, upper body part nude, and lower body dressed in skirts made out of animal hides. They are accompanied by children who walk next to them, and they carry additional children in baskets on their backs. In some cases, 
like the one here on the left from Tibun Tum 100 of Vizier Rechmire during the reign of King Tutmosis III of the Yehi dynasty, which we already saw. The basket on the back is balanced with the use of a thumb line clearly attached to the forehead. It is striking not only that some 1,400 years later, we find the same iconographic type of an imprisoned Nubian woman on the reliefs of Meriti Temple M250, but also that here too, in some cases, women use thumb lines to balance their baskets. We have two possibilities to explain this. Either we are dealing with an iconographic transfer from New Kingdom Egyptian to Napaton temples and from Napaton temples to Meriti temples. This would not be surprising since the New Kingdom Egyptian temples were also built in Nubia and could have been seen by Napaton and Meriti craftsmen. The other possibility is that the use of the thumb line by Nubian women to balance baskets on their backs has a long history and tradition spanning back at least into the late Bronze Age. In fact, the use of the thumb line is still attested nowadays in Africa, for example, among the Lu and Kikuyu in Kenya. Currently, I am working with a team of bioarchaeologists from the University of Leiden on an investigation of traces such body techniques could have left on the bones. I would like to use the opportunity to thank Jared Cabello Perez Sarah Shrada and Rachel Hall for the work on the skeletal remains from the Nubian Cemetery of Abu Fatima, and we already have some interesting results. Returning to the temple M250, it is clear that the southern temple wall depicts Nubian prisoners of war, as we have seen, which is indeed to be expected if one bears in mind the north-south axis of ancient Egyptian and Nubian temple decorum. With this logic in mind, one would expect that the northern wall depicts a northern enemy. The only northern enemy of Meru at the time was Rome. It is therefore not surprising that some of the soldiers depicted on the reliefs of the northern wall carried headgear associated to the northern enemy in Meritic iconography, an enemy referred to as Temei in Meritic texts and translated by Claude Vili as white people. I personally prefer to understand this word as a word in simply to northerners. Now it is interesting that the overall rings in which toponyms and ethnonyms of defeated enemies are usually written were left uninscribed on the northern part of the temple pylon, whereas they were inscribed on the southern part of the temple pylon. The temple was undoubtedly finished but for some reason, the names of the defeated enemy, lands or towns, were left out in association to the enemy depicted on the northern wall. Bearing in mind the north-south decorum axis and the presence of the so-called northern enemy type, I carefully suggested that the reason these oval name rings are empty is because the depicted enemies are soldiers of the Roman Empire, of which Marites did not know much at that point in time. Indeed, they use a generic term arome for Rome and the word me for foreigners, nothing else. One is therefore reminded of Strabo's geography in which he reports that when the treaty had to be signed between the Merits and the Romans, the Merits were told to go to Samos and meet Augustus there, to which Merits replied that they did not know who that was. It is equally possible that Strabo deliberately represents Merits as ignorant, a strategy similar to his other representations of foreigners, to which I will come back again later. In conclusion, when gender as a frame of war is concerned, just like in ancient Egyptian iconography, although imprisoned, women and children are never depicted as victims of physical violence. The registers with imprisoned women and children on the northern wall of temple M250 in Mere depicts them together with cattle, something we have seen in the lists of spoils of war from earlier Nubian texts. Next, I would like to turn to the feminization of enemies in ancient Nubian texts. As anthropologist Marilyn Stratton argued, relations between political enemies 
stand for relations between men and women. There are numerous examples of feminization of enemies across cultures, and I dealt with ancient Egyptian and Nubian evidence in my book, Violence and Gender in Ancient Egypt from 2021. The following discussion is based both on my own research and the work of other Egyptologists. Maybe the most illustrative Nubian royal text for the feminization of enemies is the triumphal stele of Pierre, now in Egyptian Museum in Cairo. In the context of gender relations between Pierre and his enemies, the stela, its iconography and text have recently been dealt with in detail by Matthias Carlsen in his paper published in the Artike Sudan, Mitteilung in the Sudan Archaeologischen Gesellschaft zu Berlin. The text of the stela deals with Pierre's triumph over the petty rulers of Lower Egypt. In the lunette of the stela, he is depicted next to and from Amun, receiving lower Egyptian king Nimrod and his wife. However, as Matthias Carlsen nicely noticed, not only is the gender order reversed, so that the wife of Nimrod comes in front of him, being first before Pierre, she is also depicted a head taller. In ancient Egyptian and Nubian iconography, According to the hierarchy of scaling or Bedeutungsmaßstab in German, the larger figures are more important figures. Behind her, Nimrod, her husband, holds a cistern, a musical instrument usually associated to women in Egyptian iconography. I would also like to add that other lower Egyptian kings depicted in the register below, kissing the soil before Pierre and Proskinesis are also somewhat feminized in their appearance, as men are usually not depicted with such curves in Egyptian, especially not in Nubian iconography. The failed masculinity of Nimrod, to use the wording of Matthias Carlsen, is thematized several times in the text. And some examples are quite explicit. It is said that the legs of the kings and counts of Lower Egypt who come before Pierre were like the legs of women, Nicola Grimal translated this part of the text in such a way to suggest that they were trembling before Pierre. But nowhere in the text is the word tremble uh, used. Hans Gedicke, Robert Wittner, and one of the ones born based Egyptologists, Amir Khawari, also understood this line as bending knees in fear of the Nubian king. However, David O'Connor and Stephen Quirk understand the text as a metaphor for the femininity of Pierre's enemies, because the legs of women are small skinned. Again, this is not stating in the text, and one has to avoid transferring more than beauty ideals about shaving skin, legs, and so on, and the gender structures uh, to the past. In fact, according to the Old Testament, Isaiah 18.2, all Nubians are described as tall and smooth skinned people, both men and women. The consequences of Pierre's victory are also in the form of a gender transformation when the text states that he returned after conquering Lower Egypt and turning bulls into women. The triumphal stela of Pierre is not the only Nubian text in which the enemies are feminized. In fact, an unparalleled motive is found in the annals of marriage King Hasiutef on a stela now in Egyptian museum in Cairo. In one stance, a chief of land Medadet, who was taken as spoils of war, remarks in a direct speech, you are my God, I am your servant, I am a woman, come to me. Namely, such a direct identification with a woman is not attested as a form of feminization of enemies in ancient Egyptian texts. Although these words were put into the mouth of Medadet's chief by the composers of the spell of Hasiutev, they are nevertheless informative on the ways domination is expressed. The chief first says that Hasiutev is a god, and he is his servant, and then he says that he is a woman. Therefore, in the background of this statement is the idea that the relation of a man to woman is like the one of a god to a servant. However, not all women 
were subordinated to all men. Meroitic royal women enjoyed some of the highest positions in relations to ruling men in the ancient world. However, having the status of a ruler and directly participating in war are two entirely different things. There are several depictions in which Meroitic royal women act violently against male enemies and prisoners. Amanisha Heto, whom we already mentioned, is depicted on the pylon of her pyramid, both piercing a group of male enemies with an arrow or spearing them. It is important to stress that in these scenes, she is not accompanied by a male ruler figure and her enemies are also male. Possibly, Shanaktaheto is depicted enthroned and under her throne are kneeling male enemies tied to a rope which she holds in her right hand, as you can see here on the left uh, of the side. Similarly, under the throne of Amanitore, we find the depiction of nine bows, a symbol of conquered enemies, which can be traced back to ancient Egyptian iconography, also here on the slide on the left. And last but not the least, Nadakamani and Amanitoria together are both depicted smiting male enemies on the pylon of the Temple of Naga. Here, Nadakamani left and Amanitoria on the right. In both cases, the enemies are male. I have insisted several times in this lecture and elsewhere that the enemies defeated by Meroitic royal women in iconography are male. This is important to stress in comparison to ancient Egyptian iconography, in which some queens, such as Nefertiti and Tia of the 18th dynasty, can be found trampling over enemies or smiting them, but their enemies are always female, and these depictions are usually accompanying the ones of the king in the same trampling or smiting posture. The violent acts of these queens or great royal wives are complementary to those of their husbands. However, the case of Meroe is different since there is no difference in the gender of enemies and Meroitic royal women do not have to accompany men in order to be depicted defeating male enemies. This brings us full circle to ancient sources describing the participation of Meroitic women in war. In the other Siculus in 1st century BCE, Agatachides reports how Marites employed women in war, stating, they also armed their women, defining for them a military age. It is a customary for most of these women to have a bronze ring to one of their lips. This is later repeated by Strabo in 1st century CE, who also mentions the participation of a Kandaki of Mary in war against Rome and described her as a manly woman who had lost one of her eyes. One should be careful not to give these words too much credit. As shown by Denise Ellen Mekoski, ancient Greek and Roman authors have the tendency to present the world of the foreigners as a topsy-turvy world in which everything is opposite to Greek and Roman norms. And this concerns especially gender. We should not exclude the possibility that married royal women made important decisions, maybe also those concerning war, but we do not have direct evidence for their participation in war or actual participation on the battlefield. All of the images of violence in which we find them are ideological in nature and are rather expressing their royal power than real historical events or their consequences. I have slowly come to the end of my presentation today. A version of this lecture will be published under the same title in the next special issue of the Tavo, a journal of Nubian studies edited by Henrietta Hafsans. We have seen that ancient Nubian lists of spoils of war, just as ancient Egyptian lists of spoils of war, were among else structured by gender, where male prisoners of war are listed before female prisoners of war having more value to the captives. The imprisoned men, women, and children were associated as servants 
to various temples and states, such as those in Kala, Sanam, or Napata. M250 is the only narrated temple where representations of imprisoned women and children are preserved. However, iconographic details indicate both a historical reference, possibly to a conflict with Rome, and copying of a motif from earlier temples, going back to New Kingdom, Egypt, and Nubia. It is interesting that all depicted imprisoned women and children are never depicted as victims of physical violence, which surely must have occurred in war. For example, earlier Neo-Syrian sources are quite explicit on this. We might be dealing here with what Jean Baudrillard called the cosmetic treatment of war in his book, The Gulf War Never Happened from 1991. We should never forget that the audiences were locals who sent their men to war, but themselves did not necessarily participate in war. In such a context, the avoidance of representations of violence against women and children probably had local ethical background. This careful framing of violence in media to meet local expectations is exactly what Judith Butler meant with frames of war, as I explained at the beginning of this lecture. Enemies in ancient Nubian texts are feminized through metaphors or metonyms. Legs of enemies are like legs of women. Enemies are like women. Enemy men are like servants, and servants are like women. Most of these metaphors and metonyms are also found in ancient Egyptian texts, and they serve to legitimize the act of violence against enemies to frame the relation between the Nubians and their enemies as an asymmetrical relation between men and women. My final argument is that framing enemies as women or women-like implicates and justifies the asymmetrical relations of power in the gender system of ancient Nubia. The presented metaphors and metonymies are associations based on a patriarchal masculinist discourse, which frames both enemy men, passive men and women, as weak and in need of protection. Therefore, there is nothing about ancient rulers, male or female, which modern scholars should glorify or romanticize. The same goes for ancient Nubian gender system. For every man and woman in power, thousands come who suffer from it. Finally, I would like to use this opportunity to raise awareness to the victims of civil war in Sudan. Spare some of your time to raise awareness of this terrible war and to donate to those in need. Thank you for your attention.